Hey guys, welcome to Digital Arts USMLA. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Yeah, I had like something stuck in my throat. So today we're going to be covering Streptococcus pyogenes. We'll begin by covering its characteristics, where it's normally found, who's affected by it, the organ systems affected by it, and the treatment options based on the type of infection and the drug mechanism of action. Streptococcus pyogenes is a gram-positive streptococci and a facultative aerobe. So they normally use oxygen, but they can survive without it. It's catalase negative. It can't break down hydrogen peroxide to water and O2. And this test just distinguishes staphylococcus from streptococcus. We can then use bile esculin auger, aka BEA, which differentiates streptococci from enterococci. So strep pyogenes can actually grow in the bile, but it can't break down the sugar, so you won't see that charcoal type black color, so it is BEA negative. Under the microscope, after staining, it looks like every other strep organism with like these big, long, hard balls. So yeah. It's also beta hemolytic, which means it has an enzyme called hemolysin. Heme for blood and lysis for uh, getting raped. Complete lysis is what it means of red blood cells. So basically all the RBCs have been lysed and all their nutrients have been sucked up. We eventually need to distinguish Streptococci agalactiae from Streptococci pyogenes. And we can do this with a few tests. One of them is the Lansfield grouping test which groups bacteria from category of A through S based on the type of carbohydrate composition of bacterial antigens that is found on their cell walls. For Streptococcus pyogenes, it's categorized as Lansfield Serogroup Group A, so that's why Streptococcus pyogenes is also known as Group A Streptococci, aka GAS. We can also use Bacitracin susceptibility test, which is a fast way to detect for GAS, aka Strep pyogenes. Bacitracin is a really strong bactericidal drug that's too toxic for systemic use, but we can use it superficially on the skin. So it can differentiate GBS, aka Streptococcus agalactiae, from GAS, aka Streptococci pyogenes. So in the case of Streptococci pyogenes, GAS, it's bacitracin susceptible, and we can see that from this picture right over here. There is a zone of inhibition around the paper bacitracin disc, so it's like getting completely ripped. Another test is the PYR test. It stands for pyrolidinyl arylamidase. Oh, crap, still can't pronounce it. Okay, but basically it's just a qualitative test that can quickly identify GAS and certain enterococci organisms. The test works by checking if streptococci can enzymatically hydrolyze l pyrolidinyl beta naphthylamide uh, Stupid word. Anyways, for strep pyogenes, it's basically PYR positive, so it can't hydrolyze it. For throat cultures, we can use the rapid antigen detection test. It's a small kit which detects GAS in a few minutes. So they actually use antibodies for detection of group A carbohydrate antigen. The indicator system used are latex agglutination or enzyme immunoassay. It's 70 to 90% sensitive and has a specificity of 90 to 100%. The way I remember Streptococcus pyogenes as group A strep is by my little horsey mnemonic slash thought process. I just think of A for ass like jackass or like donkey, and then think of pyogenes as a pony, and now you just make the connection. So yeah, I mean, it's like really shitty, but it works for me, so yeah. So GAS affects pretty much all age groups and causes both acute and chronic infections. And for the main things that we have to worry about for GAS, aka streptococcus pyogenes, is pharyngitis, strep throat, rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis, impetigo, necrotizing fasciitis, scarlet fever, pandas, and cellulitis. GS causes pharyngitis aka strep throat, which if not treated can lead to devastating complications. Strep throat usually appears in kids, and we can use the Centaur score, which estimates the probability that the pharyngitis is from a streptococcal organism. Just remember that you can only use this score in young patients who have had an acute pharyngitis for at least three days. The, the score consists of exudates, 
or swelling on the tonsils. So you may see them like white or yellow crap growing in the back of the throat. Tender, swollen, anterior cervical lymph nodes. A fever, usually like 100.4 or higher. If it's a low-grade fever, then you probably want to think of like a viral infection. And if there is a cough present or not. So strep throat does not present with a cough. A score of four points means that there's a greater than 50% chance that the pharyngitis is due to GAS. And you should start treating right away because it's really contagious through respiratory droplets. Along with this, they may have pain with swallowing and their tonsils may look like really erythematous. So it's like really, really red. For treatment options, we can use amoxicillin. It's a bactericidal drug that inhibits cell wall synthesis. But since the USMLV is always trying to like screw with our lives as medical students, the patient in the question stem will always be allergic to penicillins. So instead of using penicillins, in that case, if they're allergic, then we have to use macrolides like erythromycin, which is a bacteriostatic drug that binds to the 50 ribosomal subunit and makes the tRNA stuck at the A site. So no translocation to the P site, therefore no protein synthesis and the bacteria eventually die. If it's not treated, then there's a 3% chance it can progress to rheumatic fever, which can start to develop two to three weeks after the strep throat infection. And it's usually going to be in immigrants, but the symptoms come up in around the teenage years or later. So it takes a really long time to do some damage. The way it happens is once strep pyogenes breaks through the innate system, our antigen presenting cells find a few of the streptococcal organisms and they pretty much beat the shit out of them. Then they present whatever remains to them to the T cells. So after the T cells see them, they get all like pissed off and shit. So they end up being like activated and they're like, I'm gonna call my boy the B cell. So then like the B cell sees it and then they start getting pissed off and then they start making antibodies. So this adaptive immune response takes a while to kick in. That's why rheumatic fever starts to develop usually two to three weeks after the pharyngitis. Since the antigens, like the M protein, which is one of the main virulence factors, on the cell wall looks similar to specific tissues in our body, like our heart or our joints, the antibodies developed against them also affect our own joints. This is known as molecular mimicry, and this is a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. So it's caused by immunoglobulins in cytotoxic cells. So for the type 2 hypersensitivity reactions, they are very specific to local tissues. The problem here is that if the patient gets repeated infections, then more antibodies are going to get made and the tissues are going to get damaged even more. That's why the symptoms develop later on in life. The Jones criteria is specific for rheumatic fever. In order to make a diagnosis, a throat culture growing GAS or elevated anti-streptolysin O titers must be present along with two major criteria or one major criteria and two minor criteria. The major criteria are joint involvement, such as like polyarthritis, pancarditis, which includes all three layers of the heart. So if they have pericarditis, then you'll hear a friction rub, it'll be positional. If it's myocarditis, then they'll have symptoms of heart failure. And if it's endocarditis, then they may have a new murmur. Subcutaneous nodules, erythema marginatum, which is like this snake-like rash and it looks like a ring starting to begin like on the arms and trunk. Sydenham chorea, which is a weird dance-like movement or fasciculations that happen only when they're awake. It's from antibodies attacking the corpus striatum of the basal ganglia due to the molecular mimicry. The minor criteria are increased CRP, arthralgias, fever, elevated ESR, prolonged PR interval, anamnesis, of rheumatism and leukocytosis. If it's not treated and the heart valves, aka the endocardium, start to get damaged or the heart failure starts to get worse from the myocardial damage, that's the point where it's called rheumatic heart disease. The mitral valve is usually affected and it causes mitral stenosis. On myocardial pathology, you may see anichgal cells, anichgal, I can't even pronounce that, aka caterpillar cells and if they're massive, they're called Ashkoff giant cells. They're associated with rheumatic heart disease. So the takeaway point is treat strep throat so they don't have to see a cardiologist for the rest of their lives. So yeah. Another problem with GAS is that patients can turn into pandas. Get it? Pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with streptococcal infections is panda. No, I was like such a crappy joke. I'm gonna kill myself. 
So this is caused by a post streptococcus pyogenes infection. The antibodies made against GAS damages the basal ganglia due to molecular mimicry. So the basal ganglia is responsible for both movement and behavior. That's why kids affected with pandas have a combination of both OCD and Tourette's with their tics and obsessions and compulsions. So yeah, it's like a whole mix of all this. So that's why if you listen to that like one song by designer pandas, he tells the whole audience indirectly he's suffering from pandas. We can see it in his lyrics with his consistent obsession with pandas being the main lyric and his constant stuttering or tics of him saying pandas repeatedly. So yeah. GS can also cause a number of skin infections ranging from impetigo, scarlet fever, cellulitis to necrotizing fasciitis. GAS causes a non-bullious impetigo, so it's a superficial skin infection common in kids, presents as a crusty honey-colored impetigo, which is really just pus. It's usually not associated with a fever, and it can appear anywhere in the body, but it's mainly on the face. It may present with discomfort or itchiness. It resolves in 2-3 to three weeks with topical antibiotics like mupirocin. GS complications from strep throat can lead to scarlet fever, which presents as a painful rash, which feels sandpaper-like in consistency and blanches with pressure. It starts in the chest and spreads over the face, along with the fever, tender lymphadenopathy, strawberry tongue, which is like this erythematous papillae over the tongue, a very red sore throat, that's from the prior strep infection. Disquamation of the skin happens about a week after the rash. The main difference between scarlet fever and rheumatic fever is that scarlet fever is caused by the strep pyrogenic exotoxin A, aka SPEA, so it's toxin mediated, versus rheumatic fever, which was from molecular mimicry, which is caused by a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. We treat scarlet fever with penicillin. And the main thing to remember is that kids can return back to school within one to two days after antibiotic therapy. And that's like really high yield. GAS also causes cellulitis, which affects the dermis layer and subcutaneous fat. The area affected is red, warm, it's usually pretty painful. Just remember, this requires a break in the skin, and this can progress to necrotizing fasciitis if not treated. Just remember, GAS is one of the most common causes of necrotizing fasciitis. This infection ends up leading to the death of the fascia, which is the tissue that lines and separates the muscle. That's why strep pyogenes is known as a flesh-eating bacteria in this case. It happens in immunosuppressed people, diabetics, trauma patients. The area infected will look erythematous and gangrenous. It will have bullae as well. Patients will have fevers and chills and it's actually pretty painful. And it spreads like insanely fast. I mean like really really fast. I've actually seen this in real life. And within 24 hours, the necrotizing fasciitis spread from the dude's like left forearm all the way to his like right pectoralis. It was pretty crazy. So one of the biggest things we have to worry about is compartment syndrome. So remember like the five P's, pain, power paralysis, pulselessness, and prestiges. So yeah, they're going to require surgical debridement, cutting the fascial planes, decreasing the pressure, which ends up pretty much resolving the compartment syndrome, along with IV antibiotics. And we're going to use a combination of penicillin G, aminoglycosides, and clindamycin to cover all the possible organisms. So all the previous problems by group A beta hemolytic strep can lead to acute post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. It presents one to two weeks after a strep throat or scarlet fever infection. It presents as a typical nephritic syndrome with edema, microscopic hematuria, proteinuria, red blood cell casts seen on UA, and hypertension, along with increased anti-streptolysin O and decreased C3 complement levels. So this is considered a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. Just remember, rheumatic fever causes a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction because the antibodies formed against the protein M on the streptococcal cell wall will later cross-react with a look-alike self-antigen present on the myocardial cell. When they react, they cause a local tissue damage. So type 2 definition is an antibody-antigen reaction and damages local tissues. 
Acute post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis is considered a type 3 because antibody antigen complexes are wandering in the circulation and then get deposited in the glomeruli. Type 3 definition is preformed immune complexes that cause remote, not local, damage. So this damage is not directly due to the bacterial toxin or the antibodies, but instead it's due to the immune complexes, which end up clumping up the whole entire like glomeruli and they end up activating all this complement and inflammatory cells and they just end up like messing up and screwing up everything. So in light microscopy it will show diffuse hypercellularity and mesangial cells seen in the glomerulus. Immunofluorescence will show granular deposits of IgG and C3. Electron microscopy will show subepithelial humps, which are really the immune complexes that have deposited in the glomerular basement membrane. Postreptococcal glomerular nephritis has a pretty good prognosis. Antibiotics are useless because it's damaged from a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, so there's no need to use any antibiotics. For the initial phase, you want to put them on like a low sodium diet to help resolve off of like the edema and the hypertension and you just want to make sure they monitor their blood pressure and then they return back to baseline within about like two months. So yeah, this is like Streptococcus pyogenes. Sorry. Um, so this is Strep pyogenes aka Group A Beta Hemolytic Strep in a nutshell. So now you know why it's known as the flesh eating bacteria and why you shouldn't just walk away from a sore throat. So yeah, thanks for watching and uh, make sure to click that like and subscribe button below. Yeah, alright, thanks and uh, see ya.